Hello, we're at the Centre for International Security and Governance at the University of Bonn and we're going to be talking about the future of the liberal world order. And we're here with the Henry Kissinger Professor James D. Bindenagel, former American ambassador to Germany and now the head of the Centre for International Security and Governance. I'm Zulfikar Abani, a senior journalist with Deutsche Welle, that's Germany's international broadcaster, and I've got the questions. Professor James D. Bindenal, welcome. Thanks for coming in and joining us for this little chat here. So far, I'm delighted to be here and talk about this very important issue. Excellent stuff. Now let's get right into it straight away. There's been a lot of discussion recently among politicians and other experts about the, the liberal world order and how it might be unraveling. Um, there's also confusion, however, over what exactly is a liberal or the liberal world order. So I wanted to start by asking you for your perspective. What do you see as the liberal world order and is it unraveling? Certainly the liberal world order that we've seen for the last 70 years came out of the Second World War and the United States decision to work with Europe, particularly in this year of the Marshall Plan, where economic relationship was the first and fundamental effort to rebuild Europe and then build that relationship, the transatlantic relationship, and then also the Bretton Woods institutions, the United Nations, all of these institutions that have acted as our way to govern the international community for the last 70 years. That is, that's what we have today, and yes, it is unraveling. It began to unravel several years ago, particularly here in, in Europe when uh, Russian President Putin at the Munich Security Conference in 2007 declared that he was not part of this international world order anymore. And since that time, it has continued to unravel. So let's roll back a little bit. You, you mentioned one sort of uh, peripheral player, if I can put it that way, at this, as things stand at the moment. Who are the main actors? Who are the, 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 the main players? And tell us a little bit more about how it came to be that they were the main players in the, in the world order. Well, certainly after the Second World War, the United States <clears throat> leadership, and particularly uh, uh, Secretary of State Marshall and uh, President Truman, reached out to the Europeans, the Europeans, Jean Monnet and Schumacher. Schumann were very much a, a part of creating the structures that would we, we would see would grow into the European Union today mm -hmm. and in the United States, the uh, development of the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, the, the uh, institutions that really have created yeah. and run and governed this world. This is, this is the structure that has provided pace. It also includes uh, NATO and the mm -hmm. security side, which is very important for us, 1949 on. And these institutions have been the stability factor that have kept uh, the world, in, at least in Europe and the United States, at peace for the last 70 years. And when you say the stability and you're around that era, you're also talking about this Cold War era, aren't you? And that was, how deciding was that? Right. I would, I would actually take it in three parts. Mm -hmm. so the, the immediate aftermath of World War II through uh, 1989, that is the Cold War period that you had, the West Germans, that is Konrad Adenauer, uh, wanted to create a stable West Germany, a stable Germany inside Europe, and decided that he needed to align Germany with the West. He called it the Westbindung, joined NATO, began the European, began what became the European Union, mm -hmm. and deferred unification of Germany. So in that Cold War period, the West Europeans developed very strongly in economic terms and political terms. And in 1989, that first period ended with a peaceful revolution with the Europeans liberating themselves from the communist world and then turned to create the second part of the liberal international order coming out as the Charter of Paris. The Charter of Paris signed in 1990 committed all the governments, including Russia, to work to develop democratic governance, democratic governments in mm. the world. And that's the second half. So in this time, we've, we've seen this, both the, the Westbindung first part, Cold War, through unification of Germany, the creation of the Charter of Paris, and the new vision of Europe that now is 
they were unraveling certainly here in concentration in Europe. As so, well. and that, that second period you're talking about, some people call it World Order 2.0. Are we now getting into a 2.3? Right. Uh, what, what is this? Are we seeing a great shift in power in the world? Right, we're seeing a lot of uh, shifts in power in the world. One, of course, is the Russian decision not to participate in democracy anymore since 2007 and to reassert uh, spheres of influence and nationalism uh, that makes a, a return to a multipolar system that we had rather than the multilateral system of the international global order. And of course, the rise of China is not to be set out. I mean, it's a very, very important factor in, in changing the world. And the rising power historically also challenges the world order. And most famously, the Thucydides gap is, is the way that we go back to the Peloponnesian War and understand that that dynamic has more often led to conflict than it has to peaceful rise. Mm. So what do you see though as, as the, the main threats? Are we talking about nations that are the main threats or are there other elements that are the main well, threats of the multilateral? You, may, you make a very, very important point is that what the system we've just been talking about is a system of states. Mm. And one other factor that has come into it is, is the rise of non-state actors and failed states. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, terrorists in, in the case of ISIS or in failed states, you could argue as uh, Syria or other states, that have uh, also changed the political nature of the, the uh, international order. So you have many challenges, not, not simply the challenge of uh, in Europe with, uh, with the Russians. But is the threat there the, those threats themselves are the non-state actors, or is it how the, the states react to those destabilizing factors? Well, certainly, if you take, a, take an analysis one step deeper into this, you will see that, of course, in the Middle East, the, uh, the, the end of uh, imperialism led to dictatorships, and then in, with the Iraq War in 2003, began to also disintegrate. And then the American policy of uh, President Obama to pivot to Asia left a vacuum in the Middle East that was not filled by the Europeans, was filled by non-state actors, mm -hmm. the collapsing of states. And so you have a, a dynamic in, in the <clears throat> Middle East, na uh, North Africa region that affects Europe tremendously. And there are other factors that are that are changing the world. If you If you look at the issue of globalization, if you turn to economic issues, e globalization has changed the world dramatically. Most of the winners in, in, from globalization have come in Asia. You can see certainly China, but also other countries, at the expense of many of the traditional kinds of jobs and manufacturing and others in the developed or Western world, if you will. Then you have another dynamic that's happening that's dramatically changing everything. Everyone now has a, a smartphone and not only a smartphone, but you have uh, on the way to driverless cars, things that uh, had provided employment, mm -hmm. that implied, uh, that therefore gave people a place in society are being replaced. And you can add to that uh, technological change where robots in mm -hmm. Germany is with KUKA is a very good example of the, the way that robots have displaced people. You mean KUKA, the, the, the robotics manufacturer? The robotic manufacturer mm -hmm. in Augsburg. If you, if you look at the, the outcome of that, I mean, those are economic factors, but the outcome is, is politically, and I would argue, for the loss of identity. People don't know where they, how they relate to their jobs and to their families and their schools and also to uh, the, the social contracts that we have and the breakdown of, if you move to uh, the gig economy for mm -hmm. Uber is one example, yeah. where uh, you can work, but you drive your own car, and you have you don't have insurance, and you don't have health and retirement, and these are changes that have really affected and and have led to populism and other. Right. Okay. So these sort of issues of identity and that. So are they? And you mentioned populism there, and a sense of nationalism also. Um, one thinks immediately of uh, the United States. Um, the words nationalism and populism have cropped up a lot over recent debates. Um, how do you, would you say that the, uh, the administration of President Donald Trump will affect the world stage, liberal world order? What can we expect there? Well, first, I, I would say that the reason we have uh, Donald Trump in the United States, the uh, Donald Trump administration, is comes out of the unraveling of what we we're talking about, mm -hmm. the loss of identity, 
the uh, social breakdown of the social contract and the failure of the leading government, governing lead, leaders in the country to address the issues that, that these changes have brought. Mm -hmm. Now you have a populist president who's, who's been the voice of those people who have been displaced and his uh, agenda is to disrupt, disrupt the international world order, disrupt the establishment, if you will, in the United States. And in this disruption, you have uh, implications of others because when you, when you disrupt something, there are others who also respond and that's what is uncertain now. How will others respond? Well, that's just it. I mean, but also the national level, the domestic level is one thing. Mm -hmm. How will it play out on, on the world stage, do you think? Can we see us, will we see a return to certain instabilities of the past? of other eras, or is this a very forward-thinking kind of new age in world order? I would argue it's not a, a forward-thinking, but rather a disrupting, disruption of what we have. So mm -hmm. if you take the specific issues, if you take uh, NATO, which has provided security within the transatlantic relationship for years, has been <clears throat> questioned. Article 5, the the Beistanzlik, the ability or the, the commitment of fighting for one is fighting for all. Uh, has been questioned. Now, mm -hmm. the president and then the vice president have reaffirmed recently that the United States will live up to its commitment, but it, they've already started the uh, uncertainties that that would happen. That means that the old international order of working together, collaborating, is being tested, and, and the Europeans have to decide how to stand up to their own responsibilities in international security with or without the United States, which is an entirely new question for them. And so the question is, what strategy do you pursue with the United States? You can argue that also happens in Asia. The most dangerous part is in with North Korea. Mm -hmm. North Korea with uh, nuclear weapons proliferation and threats to its neighbors, including in the United States, actually connects back to the Europeans because if an attack comes from North Korea, nuclear or non-nuclear, on the United States, then the Article 5 of the NATO Treaty applies and the Europeans would be called in to defend against North Korea. So let's talk a little bit more about the Europeans and in particular Germany. What, what is Germany's role at this time as the world order stands now? So Germany faces a, a really important change in what it, its role will be. In the White Book from 2016 that uh, set out Germany's defense and security policy, <clears throat> they two interesting things, for me anyway, have, have been highlighted in, in this paper. One is that Germany in the paper discusses its interest, that is German interest, and for most of the last 60 years, uh, German interests have been characterized as European interests. That isn't to say that they're different, their interests are the interests they've been saying, but to just characterize them as, as German interests is, is a change in an approach mm -hmm. to what is important for Germany to do. And the second is in, in uh, defense itself, the role of uh, the Bundeswehr has described in the White Book as a leading role for the Bundeswehr, which in German is a Führungsrolle der Bundeswehr, which is a, also two words that don't normally come to mind. And so you see there's a change in the way that Germany will take on more responsibility in the words of President Gauck and Ministers von der Leyen and Steinmeier in 2014, or Germany will take on a leadership role, whether it wants to or not, and that how Germany takes on a leadership role be very very important. So, so those are the implications of a shifting world order if as you say it unravels further perhaps? Yes absolutely these are these are the, the changes that are happening and and the leadership issue for Germany is I think the most interesting and questioned. So I've tried to uh, look at what Germany has done recently and if you take what German leadership has sound, have you seen leadership coming? So in in the case of Ukraine, the the invasion of Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea, Germany gathered up other leaders and has led the European Union to sanction uh, the Russians for that action and maintained the uh, non-recognition of Crimea. 
Then, mm -hmm. if you take the uh, the Normandy process, that was a very uh, Normandy format. The Normandy format is also very interesting because then you don't have Germany leading alone; you have it leading together. Or you take the Visegrad. So I've characterized this uh, kind of leadership as partners, uh, leaders in partnership. The leaders coming together in partnership to solve problems. And in these these three cases, it's without the United States. So if, if Germany is taking a leadership role in a sense to assure, to work towards a peaceful status in a sense, it's, it's trying to, in a sense, safeguard the original liberal right. world order. Would you say that it is seen as a guardian of the liberal world order, Germany, Germany and in particular Angela Merkel's administration? Certainly. And if you look at uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel's congratulatory message to President Trump when he was elected, that. The transatlantic relationship remains the foundation of German foreign policy, and I would argue also transatlantic foreign policy. And it is based on values, and she then outlined the values, rules of law, democracy, freedom, human rights. The very things that are that bind us together, the very things that make it possible for leadership, and that's the criteria for leadership. Mm -hmm. I've been very disappointed in the response from the administration because they've only responded in terms of interests, not of values. Mm -hmm. And so what about um, Germany's other traditional partners, France, say, um, uh, what will we see there with the, the newly elected uh, President Emmanuel Macron? Um, what do you see happening there? Well, if you if you watch the Chancellor over the last uh, year or two, and you've seen the election of the PIS in Poland and the Orban in Hungary and uh, Erdogan in Turkey and Trump, mm -hmm. by the time you get to the election of President Macron, you see a, uh, a very sad, tired face of a chancellor to one who's very brightened and smiling and sees actually, I think, conveys the hope that France and Germany will be able to come together and maybe reestablish the Elysee Treaty kind of relationship that started the European so, project. Some, some light at, at what has been a bit of a tunnel at the moment. Bit of light. Yeah. <laughs> so is that where you see uh, the world order going now? I mean, what's your prognosis? Uh, what will the world order a, be? What would it look like in, say, the next five years, in well, five years? The changes that we've seen are from this multilateral system of the World Bank and, and uh, UN and, and NATO and the EU to a multipolar system with China, Russia, India, Brazil, fading, competing on the, in the world stage, it shows that you have uh, already a change from what's happening, but there's no guarantee that, that this will, will actually come together. Mm -hmm. If you look at the historical analogy with Metternich, there was somebody to balance these, and uh, Mr. Kissinger talks a lot about uh, balance of power. But if there's no balance of power, you're not moving to a new system, a new structure of multipolarity, mm -hmm. but you're rather uh, moving to chaos. And that is a very disturbing concern because if there's no one in charge, no one to manage the international order, then you have a more Hobbesian um, effort. In fact, what um, National Security Advisor McMaster and the Economic Advisor to Mr. Trump, Mr. Cohn, noted in the aftermath of the president's trip to Europe mm -hmm. that uh, the president came with a vision that there is no international community, but that there are individual countries competing for their interests. Very disturbing concern. Well, Henry Kissinger, Professor James D. binden thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. I'm very delighted to be here. Thanks so far. Excellent stuff. Now, this has been a little chat here from the Centre for International Security of Governance at the University of Bonn. And if you'd like to read more on this and other issues, why not get this? This is the Centre's own book, International Security in the 21st Century, and it's published by the Centre for International Security and Governance and the Bonn University Press. So get that, why don't you? I'm Zulfikar Abani, saying thanks for now. Until next time, goodbye.